Uh, this episode is actually brought to you by Red Sea Catholic Radio. They've generously offered their recording studio for us to use today. Uh, Red Sea is a local Catholic talk radio here in College Station. Uh, you can check them out at redsearadio.org. That's red, like the color, C like the letter, radio.org. Uh, today I'm in studio with our classic co-host and part-time Chinese room decorator, Andrew Robbins. <laughs> Howdy, everyone. Uh, today we have our special guest, Dr. Jay Bujishevsky. He is a professor of government and philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we'll forgive him for that one. Uh, his specializations include political philosophy, ethical philosophy, legal philosophy, and the interaction of religion with philosophy. Among his research interests are classical natural law, virtue ethics, moral self-deception, the role of family in political and social orders, and religion in public life. You can find him online at undergroundthomist.org. Dr. Budzhevsky, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm really glad to be here in Aggie Land. Let's start off with a little biography. Today, most people know you as a fairly well-known Catholic scholar, uh, focused right in that natural law tradition. Um, but that's not where you started off. I had uh, I had actually been raised in a Christian home. I was uh, baptized. I believed it. I, I meant it. Um, but I abandoned my faith, like a lot of young people do, when I went off to, uh, not long after, after arriving in college, and uh, was more than an atheist. I was really a nihilist, because after... After, after finding that I no longer believed in Jesus Christ, I, I soon found that I didn't believe in God at all, um, or at least this is what I told myself. I, I do think that deep down, I really knew that there was a God, but I was telling myself that there wasn't. And then it became difficult to, if there was no lawgiver, it was difficult to believe that there was any law, any moral law, any right and wrong. And uh, eventually it became hard even to believe in the reality of, my, of myself as a person, a, a being with a will who is responsible for himself. I, I, you know, I, ideas of mechanism or determinism um, appealed to me, although uh, you know, even, even there, if I was just a machine, then how could I even trust my own reasoning that I was a machine? Because the machine is not uh, is not directed to truth; it just follows its program. Mm. So this was uh, I was I was I was in um, I was in a, a quite a mess. The path out of it. Well, there were two aspects of this. I was uh, I was pretty desperate, actually. I um, it was uh, this is a miserable existence. I loved my wife and children, for instance. But consider, uh, love is a commitment of the will to the true good of a of another person. I didn't believe in persons. I didn't believe in good. I didn't believe that my my will was in my control. Uh, my com- that my commitments were in my control. So I loved them, but I couldn't even make sense of that love anymore. Uh, I actually did. Um, pray to God one evening. I, I, I didn't believe he was there. I told him, I, I think I'm talking to the wall, but if you're there, you can have me. But I can't tell anymore. You would have to show me. And nothing happened, it, as so far as I could tell. The, the, the walls didn't open up. There were no angel choirs. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I didn't hear heavenly music, and so I thought I was right. I was talking to the wall. <laughs> but some weeks later, I found something happening. It was a change in my perception of myself. I began. I mean, I was a mess. But there's a difference between being being miserable and um, and actually recognizing that your condition is objectively wrong. I recognized my condition was objectively evil. No, so what? Well, if you're telling yourself that there's no objective, rationally discernible difference between good and evil, then the recognition that your condition is objectively evil means that you were wrong about that. Mm. And if if your condition is evil, there's no such thing as a pure evil, and evil is always a good that's been messed up. That meant that if there was an objectively horrible, there had to be an objectively wonderful. If there was a good and an evil, well, then I'd been so wrong for so long about so many things that almost anything could be true. And I began reconsidering uh, the Christian faith that I'd given up, and eventually one day discovered that for some time I had been... Uh, believing it again and just hadn't 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 noticed. It seemed that if it's true, nothing made sense but to give myself up to this truth. So I did. Mm-hmm. Would it be accurate to say that you more or less discovered God was already in the architecture of your belief, um, rather than like some people would convert because they follow evidence and then find God as a thing that's out there, and then they just kind of put that into their belief system. Um, if for about two years after returning to belief to believe in God, it was very disturbing to me that I wasn't able to trace the rational steps. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were many things that made sense to me on the hypothesis that there is a God, but that did not make sense if there was no God. And um, now there, I 
I know now that there is a name for that kind of inference. It's called inference to the best explanation. Um, but I didn't know that then. And, uh, and so I worked, my, I worked my way back by processes that were rational, but I didn't even realize how rational they were. I, th- I think that this was a, a mercy of God, actually, because I had left him by an, by an excess of intellectual arrogance. So he brought me back by means that, uh, that humbled me. I couldn't take credit for them. Presumably, um, you made a step from there being a God to Christianity specifically. Uh, was that all in one step? It was all in one step. All, all in one, one instance. Mm-hmm. I see. After that, you then went into political philosophy. Is that correct? Well, I was already in political philosophy, although okay. it was in a bizarre sort of way. I mean, how do you do political philosophy if you don't think that there's a real difference between good and evil? Um, it means that these are just naked assertions of will, which was which was a bizarre sort of sort of view. I had arrived at the University of Texas to give my job talk as a young scholar, freshly minted PhD, uh, green, and had uh, you know announced to them that uh, I didn't I didn't think that there was a, a uh, I didn't think that our commitments are in our control that I didn't think that there was a rational difference between good and evil, but I had a but I had a plan for reconstructing political philosophy along those lines. <laughs> Uh, they should have sent me down to the local mental institution, but instead they gave me a job teaching the young. Well, mental institution, UT Austin. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, almost all universities can be can be pretty fairly described as uh, mental institutions now. And I won't say that about uh, about A and M, but maybe. <laughs> well, I, I, I know some interesting professors here as well. Um, so, so, so let's talk a little bit about political philosophy. Sure. Um, it's, it's actually something that's kind of close to my heart um, because whenever I came to college, uh, you know, I, I came from a pretty standard background in Texas where, you know, you're assigned being a Republican and you've got your little mm-hmm. checklist. Mm-hmm. And then you start encountering all these other perspectives and it's very difficult to reevaluate those initial political beliefs, but more importantly, uh, develop like a rigorous political philosophy that's, that's internally consistent. How, how would you recommend that young people, particularly young Christians, where, where should we start in uh, developing that political philosophy? Well, I think one thing that's important is to, is to recognize that although politics requires a moral foundation, um, a political philosophy is nevertheless a lot harder than moral philosophy. Mm-hmm. It's not really difficult to recognize, for instance, that it's wrong to deliberately take innocent human life, that or or uh, or to or that it's wrong to violate your marriage vows, that there are various moral principles that we should observe justice. Um, figuring out what that implies for politics is is much harder, and this is not just deduction from first principles. You can't just prove theorems. Oh, therefore, we should have this kind of a republic. Um, a lot of what we have come to understand about politics has been uh, a matter of prudential judgment on the basis of a lot of experience. So I think that one thing that uh, I would recommend to students is that they learn something about the natural law tradition, and they also read some of the greats, read some of the classic works in uh, in in political theory, not excluding uh, some of the some of the great works in the uh, in the American founding period, like uh, Federalist Number Ten. One trend that I've kind of seen with some Christians formulating their political philosophy is also remaking Jesus in their own image. I cannot count how many times I've heard people say, well, Jesus was actually a socialist or yeah. a libertarian or some other right, made right. up thing. Yeah. You know, that. Yeah, there are several different motivations for this. One common motivation for this is that um, some people who believe that. Um, Scripture is a kind of an encyclopedia of everything that you want to know on every and any subject that you want to know anything about. Uh, assume, well, it's got to tell us everything that we need to know about politics. It doesn't. But in order to, con- but therefore, what you do is you read your own political views into the scripture, and try to fool yourself and not think that you're doing that. I call that projective accommodation. Um, and it's uh, it's the the so you know you can say Jesus said feed the poor so he's a socialist that does not follow it um, how to feed the poor is a question is this something that the government is even good at or does the government make things worse these are these are difficult these are these are difficult questions and people tend to leap from one thing to another or uh, or Jesus was a libertarian well <laughs> we're according to according to the new testament we're we're certainly uh, free in one way we're freed from the from bondage to our passions and greedy impulses and uh, you know the mastery of sin 
But uh, what does that tell you about? Uh, and and slaves in the New Testament were encouraged to avail themselves of opportunities to become free if they could. But what does that imply about political freedom? It doesn't. Um, uh, it doesn't tell you much. Uh, now, I do think that the Scripture tells you some things. For example, um, we learn from Scripture that God holds nations to account, that he judges them, that, uh, that there, is, um, there are consequences for acting unjustly. Um, we, we know that, uh, that the just purposes of human government include uh, commending good and punishing evil and maintaining peace and protecting the oppressed. But that doesn't tell you, for instance, should you have a... Uh, a separation of powers, should you have a constitutional regime. We, we conclude these things on the basis of reasoning um, using premises that exceed that what's, what's in Scripture. Mm-hmm. This will upset many people, they say, but we should only use what's in Scripture. Um, but if you're using the natural law, what they often overlook is that Scripture itself testifies to the reality of the natural law. Mm-hmm. Scripture doesn't say... Uh, God doesn't tell you anything. God doesn't give you um, mental equipment to learn anything except by reading the Scripture. Scripture actually says the opposite. Paul speaks of the law written on the heart. Uh, the the uh, both the Old and the New Testament indicate that uh, that that as you uh, sow, so you will reap. All right, that's the witness of natural consequences. That's used by the natural law. Mm-hmm. Um, we, um, we, we have Paul saying in the first letter of the letter to the Romans that um, certain sexual behavior is wrong because it is contrary to nature. All right, he's saying there's a standard for how we should live in the way that we are made. Um, all of these are resources that they're, they're mentioned here in Scripture, but they're affirming things that you could have noticed if you hadn't ever read the Scripture, if you'd never heard of it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Scripture acknowledges that. So somebody who says, I can't pay attention to natural law, I can't just use my mind because I'm reading Scripture, is not reading Scripture very carefully. Mm-hmm. There would be some Christians that can agree with you that there are several principles that we can discern independent of Scripture, uh, things that are shared by multiple traditions. Uh, then there's this other group of Christian that um, I'd like to bring you into conversation with. They make a pretty radical claim that God actually has outlined for us the ideal government in the Mosaic Civil Code. And it sounds like you probably have some disagreements uh, with, with that general idea, that not only is the ideal government found in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, but in fact, every government, if it is serving God, ought to establish their government in, yeah. in that pattern. I, I don't think this, this, this view presents itself as in the name of being faithful to Scripture, but mm-hmm. I don't think this view itself is faithful to Scripture. It isn't, I mean, even apart from, from, from the question of following Old Testament civil law or political law or constitutional law, there's simply the question of the moral teachings of the Old Testament. Jesus himself makes clear that the moral teachings of the Old Testament were a stage in the education of the people. He says, uh, he says, you have heard, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That, by the way, was not uh, an encouragement to revenge, but in a limitation of revenge. Um, but I tell you, don't take revenge at all. You know, he said, you, you, know, you were allowed to uh, divorce your wives, but that was because of the hardness of your heart. Uh, um, I'm telling you that, that, uh, that you are not to, to divorce. So what we have to see is that the laws that were, that were given to the people of uh, Israel in the Old Testament were appropriate to their state of understanding and their stage of development. Mm -hmm. And uh, God knew what he was doing. He gave them laws that were appropriate to that. But but that didn't mean that those laws were entirely appropriate to, 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 to us. The fundamental moral principles underlying that law, for instance, do not murder, you know, do not... Do not steal, honor your parents. Of course, those are true everywhere. But the, you know, the juridical applications that were drawn from that were not. To take just another example, there are certain, uh, there are certain penalties for certain crimes outlined in Old Testament law. But, you know, this was, uh, this was uh, Bronze Age and Iron Age people who, who um, did not have the wealth to build prisons. We have prisons now. Now, that ought to imply something. We have a, a wider palette of opportunities available for the correction of wrongdoers. And, uh, and we aren't necessarily limited to the, to the ones that were appropriate for that people then. You know, it's just like we see today, uh, driving on the right is appropriate in the United States, driving, driving on the left is what you do in England. There are some things that do not change anywhere, like, like the prohibition of murder. But there are other things which are applications of those principles, and those can change. I see. So would it be accurate to say that um, the natural law is the soil from which both the Mosaic Code and our current codes also 
uh, draw their life? Would that be an accurate? Yes. The greatest natural law thinker of, uh, of, in history, who was Thomas Aquinas, remarked that every one of the moral precepts, the underlying moral precepts of, uh, of the law of Moses, are precepts of the natural law. Okay. But he said the ceremonial precepts aren't, the judicial precepts aren't. Right. Those are applications. Mm-hmm. I think in the background of, of this conversation um, is also the issue of tolerance, right? Mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. If, if you go to the Old Testament, there are some things that are tolerated that are not tolerated mm-hmm. uh, today. Um, and then in our current conversation, there are many, many, many political debates over this may be something that you personally disagree with, but publicly, in public policy, uh, it still needs to be allowed. Mm-hmm. So um, I'd like to uh, discuss this on two different levels. So the first one is, from a public policy perspective, um, how do we go about striking that medium between everything is allowed, anarchy, and only the state-sponsored morality is accepted? Well, the first part of the answer to that question, you've already indicated in the way that you set up set up the question. Mm-hmm. Uh, you said, how do we strike the medium? Many people do not realize that there is a medium to strike. Uh, at one extreme, there are people who say, well, the only thing that you should tolerate is what's absolutely good and right. Well, now, it seems that that's, uh, that that's a flawed point of view. Suppose, for instance, that we thought that since um, it is wrong to, to deny God, we should put all atheists in prison. What would you do? Would you be building a nation of faith that way? No, you'd be building a nation of hypocrites. It's absurd. Uh, there are some, some uh, means of trying to suppress wrong things that really hurt good things, and uh, bring about more wrong things. So that view can't be right. In the other direction, though, there are people who think who think um, tolerance is good. Tolerance means tolerating, tolerate everything. Now, if nobody really believes that rape and murder should be tolerated, but on the other hand, they often reason as though they thought that way. They, for instance, a psychologist will develop tests of tolerance that put controversial stuff on a scale, and the more items on the list you tolerate, they say the more tolerant you are. Actually, tolerance isn't tolerating tolerance as a virtue tolerance is tolerating the right things just like a coward is not somebody who's who's who who is uh, who always suppresses his fear he's rather a person who knows when to advance in battle and when to retreat right you know when to rush into the burning building to put out the fire and when to get out of there before the building collapses um there is a mean between cowardice and rashness and that mean is is courage, and in the same way, there's a mean between soft-headed indulgence and uh, and uh, and and overbearing intolerance, and that mean is true tolerance. Now, what this means is that the approach that many people take to tolerance is wrong. They think, in order to be tolerant, I have to suspend judgment about what is good and evil. Who am I to judge? Um, uh, I, you know, you have your idea about good and evil, and I have my idea, and we just won't won't do that. Um, when you, pre- when you try to convince yourself that you're not judging, what actually happens is that you're making a judgment and it's getting, it's getting slipped into the argument. With, it's getting slipped in with, without argument because you don't notice it is a judgment. The, the, the way to be tolerant is to judge better, to be more discerning, more discriminating as to which evils um, uh, need, to be, need to be suppressed and which evils, on the other hand, uh, need to be tolerated lest even greater evils take place. I'd like to transition a little bit on the, the, the personal level. It may be the case that, just to give an example, that the federal government may not, may not be able to regulate things like adultery. That's just something that practically is extremely difficult. Um, can I in, jump in on that? Oh, sure. There are, on the other hand, uh, indirect ways in which you can encourage marital fidelity. Uh-huh. Uh, it seems to have been a catastrophe, especially for women, when we abandoned the older policy that you could that you had to show cause for a divorce and instead went to no fault divorce, mm-hmm. uh, and w- since that change, especially women are are much worse off after divorces. And uh, you know, simple abandonment is is on the on the on the increase. So there are things that you can do. Now that's not a matter of criminalization. Mm-hmm. You're you're quite right. But there are lots of things that the law and public policy can do um, besides criminalizing. I see. As Christians acting on the individual level, what might we be able to do to um, to strike that medium in our own life? You know, there because okay. you know there are mm-hmm. friends that we have that they do things that we don't necessarily approve of, but we don't want to be that friend, you know, that says don't do that all the time. Sure. Yeah. Well, there's a, let's say that uh, that you're a Christian. You understand that uh, the sexual powers were given to us for the uh, 
for uh, for the procreation of children and raising them in a in a in a loving bond between the the mother and the father, so that kids have a mom and a dad. Uh, well, that implies that it's inappropriate to have sex outside the marriage bond. You know, you have kids growing up without without dads, without moms. Uh, you know, or or pe- being passed from mom to mom to mom. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't this isn't this isn't good. And uh, and and the pill is not a solution to that. It's actually it's actually increased the consequence, the bad consequences of this rather than lessen them. You realize this, so you don't do this. But you don't want to be a nag and say you say to your friends all the time, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. There may be times when your friends are actually open to such discussions, especially when they're hurting. Mm-hmm. But most of the time they're not. All right. Does that mean you have to break off with those friends if they're not being a bad influence on you? No, it doesn't mean that. But on the other hand, you don't you don't have to cooperate in their behavior. You don't have to facilitate it. For instance, um, your friend says, "Can I? You know, I've 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 uh, I've lost the lease on my apartment. Can I stay overnight in your place? Sure. Uh, can I bring my girlfriend and have her in the same bedroom? No. Right. Uh, you know, you can do that in in your house, but in in my house, we 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 do it differently. Okay. So there's a difference between uh, tolerating and being complicit in something. And we must we must not uh, be complicit in what is is in what is really wrong. So you're suggesting there, perhaps a, a, as a good friend, that we never encourage and facilitate, but also we only I guess you could say strike while the iron's hot. Because if you provide moral guidance when they're not open to it, it they're just not going to listen to you. Right. right. But on the other hand, if you, if there will be times when they're mm-hmm. open, you won't notice them if you're not looking for them. You won't notice them if you're not praying for them, mm-hmm. and you'll mess up the opportunity if you're not uh, if you're not praying about that too. But in fact, people are rather desperate sexually. You know, people do anything that they want to these days. Uh, anonymous hookups are 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 just all the rage, um, but it's not making people happy. It's making them miserable, and there are times that they just crash. And when it is an act of mercy rather than puritanical nastiness, to say, you know, uh, do you want to talk about why you're getting hurt like this? You know, we've got a we've got a certain idea understanding that's different than yours, and I. I be glad to talk about that with you if you want. Yeah, yeah. I think we should uh, talk about that right now because, um, as if religion and politics were not individually controversial, you've also done a lot of writing on sexual ethics mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I understand it correctly, your uh, central point is that actions have meanings, um, irrespective of what we say that they are. Uh, sometimes those actions actually have more meaning than than the words that we're that we're. Uh, assigning to them. Well, one of my central points anyway, yeah. Yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, sure. Uh, sure. So I'd like to start with that just as a jumping off point. Sexual acts then have meanings, uh, and there's a, and like you are, you've already alluded to, there's a lot in the culture um, that says, no, sexual acts don't really mean anything, um, or they just mean things that are more or less trivial. So in, uh, in your work, what would you argue is the actual meaning behind sexual actions? Well, when a, uh, when a man unite sexually with a woman even the verb that we use here unite is very powerfully suggestive you know you're don't you're giving your body to this to this to this thing that is greater than your body to this union this is a gift of yourself mm-hmm. this is what it is in itself now you may not want to give yourself you might say i'm just doing this for pleasure right uh, uh, uh hasta la vista babe but mm-hmm. but in fact um, uh, it would be as silly to deny that the sexual act is about the mutual donation of self as it would be to deny that when you slap somebody across the face, it doesn't mean I love you. And, uh, and we, need to, we need to live in, uh, in keeping with those meanings. To, to give yourself to, that, to, to the other person implies, among other things, uh, uh, a gift of yourself has to be indivisible. You can't divide yourself up under um, among different people. Um, so this is going to be to one person. This is you've given yourself. You don't have powers to take it back. This is indivisible. Um, this is this is going to have to be faithful. This is going to have to be a total sharing of of um, of life. What is that? That's well. That's called marriage. This is also going to have to mean. You know, if you're giving yourself to somebody in all that this represents, including the, which, and one of the things obviously it represents, this is this is this is inescapably a meaning of the sexual act is the possibility of new life. So you're giving yourself to that possibility too, 
and uh, you know you, you, to 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 say I'm giving yourself myself to you completely, honey, except not that. Even even some of the language we use, barrier methods. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's a barrier, all right. You're 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 making a barrier, be in in more ways than one. Mm-hmm. So you've made several claims there about what the sexual acts mean. Um, how might we come to know what those? Um, how do we come to know these truths about what what the actions mean? Obviously, the the part about procreation that seems fairly apparent. Um, yeah, yeah. You, well, you know, there are two there are two approaches to this, and some of, one approach to this works uh, is is more persuasive with some people, mm-hmm. and another another approach is more persuasive with some other people. You know, you have to meet people where they are. the The approach that I've just described, uh, which begins with, okay, in Christian thinking. There are three goods involved in sexuality and marriage. There is the procreative good, there's the unitive good, and there's the sacramental good. It brings the two people together in a way that represents the bond between Christ and his church. Um, Now, the way that I just described starts with the unitive good. And there are some people who are really alive to that, and they, they, they catch what you're saying when you talk about this. They immediately understand this. Uh, and other people who really don't. Uh, there's uh, some people, it's, it makes better sense with them to start with the procreative good. You know, Why do we even have sexual powers? Now, you don't just start with that question. If you say, why do we have sexual powers, people will say pleasure. But, you know, but that's inconsistent. That's not really how they think about any other power. Why do we have, have uh, eyes so we can see? Why do we have ears so we can hear? Why do we have hearts to circulate the blood? Why do we have lungs so that we can oxygenate the blood? Why do we have uh, eyebrows to keep the sweat out of the eyes? Why do we have the capacity for anger uh, in order to arouse ourselves to the orderly defense against um, something that endangers what is good? Uh, why do we have sexual powers? And now people are going to make us give us a more, more sensible answer. They're going to say, well, procreation. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Well, then... Uh, if it's about procreation, if it's about turning the wheel of the generations, if it's about children, uh, we're not just talking about, about, about having babies like guppies, are we? That's not the way that human beings procreate. We form families. The kid needs a mom and a dad. And so uh, casual sex and all of these kinds of things are just not appropriate here. There is a reason, you know, we, it, we, are, we are naturally designed so that the procreative act takes place in a, in a, in a context of union. Guppies aren't designed that way, but, but we are. So you can start with procreation and move toward union, or you can start with union and move, move toward, toward uh, procreation. And there are all sorts of other ways that, ways that you may approach these things depending on the... Um, what the person you're talking to already gets and what he doesn't get, and he's going to get some of it. Mm-hmm. He can't not get any of it and still be a, be a human being. Mm-hmm. I'd like to focus in on that procreative knowledge there. Uh, you mentioned, for example, the difference between humans and, and guppies procreating. I'm curious to know what influence um, evolution may have on our epistemology. If, if we yeah. look at human beings as, you know, the, the sexual dimorphism that exists in, in human beings, if that's a result of evolution, uh, does that in any way undercut our, I guess, design inference? Yeah, well, uh, let's think about this. In the first place, it is certainly true that natural selection can explain some things. Finch beaks get longer, finch beaks get shorter, the feathers of something in a, after they've lived in a certain climate for a long time get, get longer and keep the, keep the bird warmer. Uh, sure, evolution, natural selection can explain some things. Mm-hmm. There are some things that natural selection cannot explain. Mm-hmm. especially the, the, those things that are distinctive to us as, as rational beings. In order for natural selection to, to account for anything, there would have to be adaptive value. Can you find adaptive value to uh, recognition of, of beauty and appreciation for beauty? Some, actually, some biologists have claimed that you could, that we like wide open spaces because we lived on the savannas and we had to see where enemies were coming. But, you know, there's a lot more to the sense of beauty than like, liking wide open spaces. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of hand-waving here in these, mm-hmm. in these explanations. Um, another silly explanation that one uh, biologist gave once, he said, he said um, an, an evolutionary ethologist, a behavioral ethologist, he said, um, he said, well, the reason human beings believe in God is that there's a God gene. Why is there a God gene? Well, it had adaptive value. What was that adaptive value? It helped the group to stay together. 
does belief in God always help groups to stay together? Aren't there such things as religious wars and schisms? You know, that's not very clear. Besides, if the group needs to stay together for survival, why not just have a gene for togetherness? <laughs> yeah. Why first have a gene for a need to, to, to have meaning, and then a gene that makes you want to stick together more if you do think you have meaning, and then a gene that makes you think that the meaning is God. And, you know, that's just, that's, that's such a cockeyed explanation. You know, you, you can't explain these things. Um, now, I, even, a, even a, uh, the strictest believer in natural selection alone Mm-hmm. He's going to come to the same conclusions as a natural law thinker about some things. Mm-hmm. He's going to recognize, for instance, why do we have the sexual powers? It, you know, it's it's not for pleasure; rather, it's for procreation. It's pleasurable so that we will, you know, have a, have mm-hmm. an incentive to engage in the procreative act. Um, that's correct. But on the other hand, if somebody wants to say, "Well, yeah, but I don't care about that. It's meaningless to me." Um, I don't care that that's why these these uh, these uh, these these powers evolved. Uh, I just want to use it for pleasure. The 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 uh, Darwinist can't give him any answer to that because, from his point of view, um, the reason we have these powers, the reason we have anything, the reason we have conscience, is just it's the result of a meaningless and purposeless process that did not have us in mind, mm. and so the outcome of it is also meaningless. The very structure of the human soul is meaningless. Our conscience is meaningless. The fact that we, you know, that we it only things only work for us in the context of a union when we procreate that's meaningless. We why it it, it, it we might just as well have been guppies mm-hmm. who eat their young instead of taking care of them. And so, if it's convenient to us, why not just rewire our brains or take drugs or or um, or have surgery on ourselves? Why shouldn't we? And the you know the pure natural selection approach has no answer to that. You can either de- you can either decide if you think that's all there is and that there's no no intelligence behind this. You can either decide that human life is meaningless, mm-hmm. or you can say it does have meaningless. So there's nothing. So, so there's something more than that. Lastly, so tonight you'll be speaking at the Veritas Forum. Uh, the title of, the title of your talk is "What Do We Really Know About Right and Wrong." Um, I don't want to preempt everything that you've got to say. Uh, we, we don't need to go into that now. Um, I just, I would like to focus on this question of, of moral knowledge. So I'm an engineer. Um, whenever I talk about knowing things uh, in the natural world, like if I say I know what the modulus of the steel is, I can do an experiment, I can get empirical data, I can do statistical analysis, and I can even put a confidence interval. I have, I know that it is this value, plus or minus 5%, 95% confidence interval. Actually, you do know some things that way, but you know a lot of other things right. in other ways. Uh, for instance, how do you know that equals added to equals are equal? Did any of your instruments tell you that? No. No, <laughs> you had to assume that in order mm-hmm. to design your instruments. The instrument, to put it another way, the instrument that told you that equals added to equals are equal was mm-hmm. your mind. You have powers to recognize certain first principles like that in mathematics, certain first principles in logic, like uh, a thing, a, a proposition can be neither true, it cannot be both true and false in the same sense and at the same time. Uh, certain uh, certain first principles in in uh, metaphysics, a, a thing can't both be and not be at the same time in the same sense. Um, and uh, certain first principles of, um, of good and, and evil. There are certain things that we spontaneously recognize. And, even, and you can form, in, formulate hypotheses in ethics, as you do in other areas like mathematics, and then check them out. Uh, the natural law tradition has been doing that for centuries. We try out the, hypo- you know, the hypothesis that, um, that uh, sex is for pleasure. It, just do- you know, it doesn't explain the phenomenon right. that, we, that we're explaining here. Um, you... you um, and you can even do statistical analysis. I wouldn't say statistics is going to show you uh, what right and wrong is. But on the other hand, you can do statistical analysis of, of what are the, as to, to study what are the consequences of flouting the natural law. Mm-hmm. For instance, we were talking about the natural laws of sex. You asked me about those. And um, the sexual revolution has, had ter- has borne terrible fruit. Mm-hmm. We can we can we can do statistical runs. Sociologists of the family have done statistical runs on things like how well do the children of fractured families divorce divorce fare in fare in later life in comparison with the uh, children of intact families 
And on many dimensions, it's very easy to show that they fare much worse. This is interesting, too, because a generation and a half ago, uh, most family sociologists thought that this was, that this was untrue. Then people were saying, well, if the parents are unhappy, it's better for the kids if they don't fight all the time in front of the kids and if they just get a divorce. After, an, after a generation and a half of, of more extensive uh, uh, longitudinal studies, you know, taking people over time, larger data sets, better statistical controls and so forth, we're finding that the reverse is the true, is, is the case. And even some of these sociologists who said that other stuff, uh, say 30 years ago, are now saying we were wrong. We were wrong. One in one famous case, I can't remember the names of the sociologists. They said if we could design a system for the uh, for the welfare of the of the of the children, uh, if we could design one from scratch, it would be that they had the they had the um, they had the attention of both the mother and the father, and da 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 da. da. It amounted to 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 basically the the Christian and the natural law picture of what a family needs to be. So so actually, I I think that. Um, that the idea that you know moral knowledge is somehow not scien- not scientific, even you know the 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 uh, the classical thinkers said spoke of they used the word science for systematic and reasoned out bodies of knowledge, and they said morals can be a science, theology can be a science, uh, mm-hmm. uh, philosophy can be a science, not just not just um, not just the study of the properties of bodies. We're about out of time, so I've got <laughs> one last question for you, and it's just for fun here. Uh, you're on the classic deserted island, and you can only bring with you, in this case, you can bring the entire musical collection of one artist of your choosing. Uh, who would that artist be? Easy. Johann Sebastian Bach. Oh, all right. Is it because he just wrote so voluminously, and you will have a lot of time? No, because he wrote so beautifully. Mm-hmm. It's satis- it, it, and the beauty is of a sort that that it, it satisfies the senses, it satisfies the mind, it satisfies at every level. And I have to say, it speaks to my spirit. When I was coming back out of, out of nihilism and returning to God, the experience of his, of, of his grace and his healing was so moving. And it was astonishing to me that uh, Bach's air on a G-string spoke to me of this experience. It always brought tears to my eyes. It still does. It makes me think of my own redemption. Now, I, would, I, would, I would say Bach. All right. And he wrote for the glory of God. Soli Deo Gloria. That's right. <laughs> uh, well, Dr. Bujicevsky, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, Andrew, thank you also for being here as well. And uh, we'll catch you next time on Think Theism. Thank you. Thank you.